Hello everyone, welcome to episode 10 of Talking Cello. Who would thought we would get this far? Today's episode I have the privilege of having the great, great cellist Steven Iserlis. I think this is going to be a great one. First of all, thank you so, so much, Steven, for, for coming to Talking Cell and talking with me. It's a huge honor for me to be really oh, talking to you. Thank you, thank you. How have you been? How, how has been this, these crazy times? <laughs> well, it's been all right. Not lucrative. <laughs> um, I joined the great ranks of the unemployed, but on the other hand, I've written a book and I've um, made a recording. Uh -huh. and I've done the odd concert for very few people, so, you know... Every day has been busy. What did you record? I recorded a disc of 20th century British solo cello music. Wow. Um, including Britain Third Suite and a piece by Frank Merrick, a suite in the 18th century style, which is lovely, and a short piece by Thomas Addis, and, and he was there at the session, which was nice. And um, yeah, it's sort of varied disc and Walton Passacaglia and a couple of other things. So it's sort of a mixed disc. I'm sure it'll sell at least 10 copies. <laughs> I'll definitely buy, buy one. When, when is the... Re I might be 11 then. <laughs> when is the releasing date for everyone watching? Oh, I don't know. Probably next year. I don't know. Probably autumn or something. Because I've got two more discs to come out before that. Oh. So. Well, we'll see. How do you prepare a recording? Is it different for you that a concert? Do you, do you prepare it in a different way? Not really. But of course everything's different at the moment. Um, I suppose I... I try not to play too much other repertoire just before a recording mm -hmm. so that I can concentrate a little bit more because you have to be twice as prepared as for a concert because you don't necessarily have the inspiration that will sweep you uh -huh. along in a concert, hopefully. Mm -hmm. In fact, I recorded for three days and the first two days I felt pretty awful as I do today because I couldn't sleep and I was very tired. And then suddenly the third day I felt much better so I recorded the whole thing like a concert. Wow. And that felt nice. That felt much nicer. One thing I'm, I was struggling now, or I was afraid of, because of the lack of playing no concerts at all, I was a bit worried that when, you know, when I get back on stage, I'm going to be like, I kind of forgot it. I, I have a feeling that to be on stage, you kind of develop like a mental shape. I don't know if you, you feel like that. <laughs> well, I've done four concerts since lockdown. One was for no audience, but a large sort of invisible audience from the Wigmore Hall uh -huh. and everybody says oh it must be so strange for you to play at the Wigmore Hall with no people in it I said no I'm <laughs> used to it I rehearse that very often with no people um, so in that way it felt very nice to be playing again I remember I enjoyed that then I did five concerts I said yeah I've done six concerts no seven concerts that's right because I did five concerts um, the same program every night at a cafe in London, a wonderful place called the Fidelio Cafe, for 25 people a night. But, you know, the place was full, it's a tiny place, they had social distancing, um, but given those parameters, it was full, and that was really nice to play 25 people every night. It really felt like you were playing for friends. And well, then I gave one more concert, which was actually outdoors, but an okay acoustic, I was surprised, for 40 people. Also, these are all solo cello, the cafe and the out-of-doors concert. Um, and no, it felt very nice how it's going to feel going on you know a big stage again but it's going to be some time to get ready for that i think what what goes through your mind when when you play a concert because it differs a lot from from musician to to musician and, and i think the audience um they don't really know what's going through our heads i mean they, they think oh he's so inspired <laughs> and so wonderful but sometimes you know we get we are thinking about, or you are stressed, or you are actually in the music, or you are something going through something else. Do, do you had ever also a stage fright at all? Do you deal with that whatsoever? I have terrible stage fright. Now, before I play, I usually think, why weren't the other million sperm a bit faster? Why didn't they swim faster and beat me <laughs> so I didn't have to go through this? Um, during the concert, I sometimes feel the same, but sometimes, hopefully, the music takes over. I mean, you're really listening 
to the music, to what the composer is telling you. Ideally, <laughs> I can easily get distracted and think about other things, but basically, I'm listening to, I mean, that's what you sort of practice, why you practice, so you don't have to think, oh, how do I, where do I move my fingers? They, that's all practiced in. And you can actually listen to the story that the composer is telling you and try and convey that. You're a sort of vehicle, um, a storyteller, just conveying it to the audience. That's best scenario. Uh, of course, worst scenario is why did that guy yawn? Why is that guy <laughs> coughing? Etc. But now maybe they won't dare cough in concerts because everybody will leave. It's great. Exactly. And now, now there is a paranoia. No one coughs. It's not, no one. I know. They're like, I, I've, I've never heard a quieter hall in my life. I just played one <laughs> concert doing this thing. Oh, you did, yeah. Yeah, and no one made a sound. Beautiful. <laughs> Brilliant. Except you, I hope. <laughs> Except me. <laughs> so you're talking about like you're listening uh, on stage and you're getting inspired by that. You always prepare. You always prepare. Um, I mean, of course, every performance so much. I, I feel like you study the score so much. You always have such a clear idea. Is there change in your interpretation from concert to concert? Uh, do you have already what oh, you yes. want? Yeah. Is it more kind of yeah, improvised? Yeah, because, well, it's not even improvising, really. It's just the, comp with great music, it says something to you different every time. And it's surprising how different. I mean, like I told you, I just did these two bar suites, one and three at the Fidelio Cafe five times over and every night it was different because the music said something different every night. That just happens if you're listening. It's like a conversation. And if you have the same conversation every every five every night for five nights, it might get quite boring. <laughs> um, of course I'm playing the same notes, but somehow they, the shapes feel different, the mood feels different, everything feels different every night. And um, that's just how music is. That's why there's infinite number, you know, it's like a beautiful work of art, but you can look at it from any angle, and it's you know beautiful in a different way. Um, so yes, it changes. I wouldn't say I change it, but it changes. Mm -hmm. It says different things to me every night. You have one of the most organic and natural shaping of the phrases I ever oh, like. I could listen to you all night. No, <laughs> when I listen to you, I'm always fascinated uh, about. Like just how natural it just sounds and it looks like you are doing nothing. Um, did you have to work on, on oh, that yes, yes, at yes. all? Uh, yeah, how did you I had to that? work at that, but I was very well taught. I was taught by my teacher. She always used to say, her expression was, playing the cello is money for jam, which means in her very quaint English, it's very easy. She always <laughs> told me it was easy and, you know, I wasn't particularly intelligent or thinking child I just believed what I was told <laughs> so I always had this feeling that playing the cello is basically easy of course some pieces are very difficult um, but still basically playing the cello is easy it should be like breathing you mm -hmm. shouldn't have to but of course you have to work very hard and of course I have to work in order to sound natural in phrasing I have to work very hard at understanding the phrase and the so music in general for example if you are imagine you're if you're having problems with some part of some whatever piece and it doesn't feel easy how how do you do to make it feel easy for you uh, physically well, it's always always going to feel easier if i have a strong musical vision i mean i can't play if i don't like a piece i play it really badly technically and everything i remember once i'm very worried because it was actually taped although i would not let them broadcast it i once <laughs> played the grave by lutislavsky in australia and it was terrible. I played it so badly because I didn't understand this music. And so in every way it was terrible. And also the Handel Halverson, that duet, I used to play a bit. And I just didn't like it enough. And again, I couldn't overcome the technical difficulties because I, I couldn't think how to play it musically. Um, but once you have a musical idea of a phrase, then everything becomes much easier. Of course, you have to practice slowly. I mean, most of my practice is for intonation. Um, and you know once you play it slowly and then it just gets faster and hopefully fine but i mean it's like an example i often use is the dvorak concerto the octaves just before the recapitulation of the first mm -hmm. movement if you think oh, i've got to play octaves and six before that and everything then it's really difficult but if you think this means it's getting more and more exciting it's going towards the recapitulation and the recapitulation is going to be thrilling because it starts with this 
not with the first subject as most recapitulations start, but with a soaring second subject and you're introducing that and building up into it. And then suddenly you don't think about how it's difficult and if you miss the octaves, people don't really notice <laughs> because they're caught up in the phrase. Whereas if you hit them, but sort of look down and look incredibly worried, well, you've missed them as far as I'm concerned because mm. you've missed the music. Oh, that's, that's great thinking for sure. That's true. So you have, um, you're so worried about the big picture, the music and everything that the hands just kind of follow the work that you have done before. Hopefully. Well, sorry, I have to practice a lot. Of I'm course. I'm not sure about the word worried. I'm thinking. No, no, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I, I said worried, but I'm, I meant your mind is into that. Concerned yeah. with, yes. Yes, um, definitely. I mean, you're thinking to musical terms. And then, you know, I don't. If I see a Cellis Novalis playing the Brahms double, that, you know, the first sort of cadenza like introduction to the exposition of the first moment, the long thing, but sitting there, sort of getting their notes right and not actually, you know, exchanging information, mm -hmm. not sort of going from one to the other and not enjoying the dialogue and everything. For me, I don't care how well in tune they play, they've missed it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's okay. Casals or something. Actually, Casals had an incredible technique when he was younger. Unbelievable. But yeah. still, you know, that's not what occasionally in virtuoso pieces you just gasp at his technique. But basically, you know, you're just listening to his his phrasing. It's just the technique doesn't get in the way. That's the point. He's got the freedom to listen to the music and that's what technique is all about. Yeah, that's definitely definitely the goal. Um I, I wanted to ask you something more more technical uh, about your legato because I'm in love with your legato. Your You are? It, are you? It's yeah, gosh, so you have sure, the... marry you. <laughs> <laughs> you have such a, a smooth right hand. It's just like I it's do. like butter. How how do you work on? Can can you try to describe me how you work uh, how you work on it or do you think or or well, you're the same? You're just thinking about the musical shape and and then your hand just follows. Basically, yeah. I mean, but I was taught to be very relaxed with the right hand. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just had a good teacher. I was very lucky in that way. Not at first. My first teacher wasn't so good, although she made me love the cello, which is a great basis. But then my second teacher, and she used to talk about wing bowing, so, you know, the wings going up and everything. And um, I probably don't actually do exactly what she told me, but I do the principle, which is just the, the fingers relaxed on the bow, but not floppy, just relaxed, just controlling it naturally and all the weight going from the shoulder right down into the bone, no kinks, no sort of, if I see somebody with sort of, you know, sharp angle, for me that's uh -huh. wrong. The, the arm never opens out, it's always smooth, always rounded. Um, but legato, I mean, you know, legato is actually, there's a lot going on within legato. A legato is not just one note held at one speed and then a smooth bow stroke to another um, bow held at the same speed. The bow is constantly changing speed. So if you play, that's legato. Whereas this is not, because you know, because the note is dead. Legato is a living thing. Uh -huh. What? How do you help uh, keeping the note alive? Is it bow speed? Is it also a lot of is vibrato? Bow speed is a lot of it. Yes, vibrato goes with it. Uh, although vibrato is an emotional thing. Um, mm -hmm. But bow speed is a lot, a lot of what legato and phrasing is all about. I mean, that's what we do. We, we players of bowed string instruments, that's the basis of how we phrase, is the speed of the bow. And that varies within every longer note. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's never just sort of, it's never flat. Do you it's have a... a thing. Yeah. So, sorry, to, uh, do you have a plan for it when you practice? Are you focus, uh, focusing also on that or is it just more instinctive? Not really. It's more instinctive when it follows. I, I have to decide where I think the phrase is going and where it's going away from. So I think every note has its place, whether it's going towards an arrival, whether it is the arrival, or it's going away from the arrival. And that will very much affect the speed of bow. I mean, it's not something I plan, the speed of bow, but, but it is. You know that's that's true every note. That's, it is of speech. If you hear if you hear one speaking, you know, you're always going towards a word, or towards a word, or towards a word. 
uh, whatever. You know, there's many different ways of shaping and, and the degree of shaping. But it's always, language is always shaping, even Finnish. <laughs> that, Finnish that, is yeah. probably the most <laughs> flat language I've heard, but still, it shapes. And it's got incredible rhythm, Finnish. <laughs> That that example that you just did uh, to say a word to say a word in so many different ways is also exactly what you meant before. No, when playing uh, the same piece five nights in a row, and even though it's the same notes or the same words, it always sounds different. You can make it different. That it just reminded me of that. Mm. Um, what about? You can make it different. It is different. I think. It is. Different. Yeah. What about um, vibrato? Do you think about it in your practice as well, or is or does it come later on? I get, well, no, I wouldn't say it came later on. I have to be careful, of course, sometimes the fingers take over instead of the heart, and I start vibrating weak notes more than expressive notes, which is wrong, and it's very easy to do. What do you As mean counts. with weak, weak notes? Well, I mean, if you want to go a phrase... Obviously, the C, the second C, was the main note of the phrase, but it's very easy to, when one's not concentrating, to go. And that gives the weak note an accent, which you mustn't have. So vibrato has to follow the phrasing. It has to be part of the phrasing, rather. And yeah, vibrato is not an automatic sound, part of the sound. I mean, depending which music you're playing. But basically, vibrato has to mean something. It has to be an emotional Um, yeah, it has to express emotion, so it comes from the heart, not the finger, ideally. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I have to keep an eye, as everybody does, on you know not being careless with that. And some, and the same with shifts; they have to be emotional. They have to come from the heart, not the finger. And again, sometimes it's so comfortable to sort of slide up the string, but it's against the expressive nature of the music. You know, it, 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 if you slide with an interval, then you're, you're somehow um, accenting that interval. You're, you're also weighting it with some emotion. And if it's not there, if it's not an expressive interval, and you slide just because your finger's comfortable doing that, you know, that's, that's against the music. And one has to concentrate on these details and not be careless. How, uh, how does these things... Do you need to adapt these things when you change from gut strings to metal strings? Or? No, not really. Is it kind of the same? Um, bowing, the bowing is a little bit different. You can use much less pressure on, or no, it's not pressure. It's, um, but you can go whoosh, whoosh, whoosh with your bow on steel strings and it'll still sound. You uh -huh. can't get away with that on gut. You have to coax the sound out of gut more. Hmm. Um, but I don't find it very difficult to go through because I play maybe 20% of my concerts on steel, 10 to 20%. Hmm. And I don't find it very hard to go th through them. Maybe if I'd learned on steel, and was going to gut, it might be slightly more tricky, but actually I find people can change quite easily. So they're not scared. They get scared of gut strings. There's nothing to be scared of. Yeah. I know you're a big defendant of gut strings, right? I don't know if any people In know. In gut we trust. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you learn on gut strings or did you? I did. Uh -huh. It wasn't oh, yeah. so unusual then. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know that. Remember, this was rather a long time ago, was in the <laughs> 60s. Um, <laughs> so we had the Beatles and gut strings. <laughs> what more could you want? Um, yeah, and I grew up in England rather than America, so gut strings were more prevalent. Most of the older players were, if they were, didn't play on gut, they still loved gut, as did Piatigorsky, as did Casals. You know, these people, were, even if they changed to steel because of sort of practical reasons, like Casals was living in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and that's when he changed, the only time he changed to steel because of the humidity that he had to understand that and Pierre Gorski said he changed because he was in California and it, the steel worked better there but um, you know there was an era and I don't think that Inescu and Casals and Thibault you know my favorite string players they wouldn't have been the same if they played on steel I uh -huh. don't think it's, it's a very different thing on the other hand another of my great heroes Daniel Shafran when I, I mentioned gut, gut strings to him he said sort of got very shocked Well, I think I played on them until 1942 or something, but then I changed. So I can still love steel string <laughs> players. <laughs> mm -hmm. What I, I want to ask you about um, 
a geeky thing about vibrato. I I remember when you went to Kronberg a few years ago. I wasn't there, but uh, I think you played chamber <laughs> and I music. Denied. <laughs> no, no, you you played some chamber music with some uh, students, I think there, and they everyone was loving that you have some kind of vibrato that you put two fingers. Oh yeah. How, how, how does that work? Uh, I, I've never... I don't know. No. Well, my teacher used to point out that if you group your fingers together, it gives much mm -hmm. more intensity. You can hear it. So I can get this <laughs> headphone out of the way. Headphone wire. So I should probably get some Bluetooth ones, but I don't. Um, that. Go away. If you want a relaxed vibrato, and if you want intense, it's true. It intensifies the vibrato. But I go a little too far. I was always criticized for that. I still do it, sometimes putting the things on top. But it's more a question of bunching the fingers together to give that. You can see that's more intense than that. It depends what sort of sound you want. Could you show us so, so we can listen to it? Oh, could you not see? I see. Well, I could get any other way. Okay, so that's... wider and slower and if mm -hmm. you want more intense and concentrated you bunch the fingers together that's as geeky as I ever get by the way <laughs> you're doing well to make me into a geek <laughs> sorry I, I just wanted to that's all right. was you really can ask cool. anything my dear your change of colors are amazing but I think that we probably the same answer as before not you it just comes from um, from here and not nothing that you are trying to do physically and and, and trying to know no, how what what physically you would do so if some some student is trying to you know in the practice room and it all sounds the same which is a very common thing that happens to all of us when we are you know learning to play an instrument how, how, how would someone change the color you're such a, a master of this or on changing colors i would like i wanted to know what's i'd what have to give them a reason for changing color i mean i don't apply colors just for their own sake i, mean, I always tell cello, violin, you know, string students, to learn the piano, and to, to look at everything at the piano first. I mean, for instance, now I'm looking at a Rachmaninoff trio, which I did play years ago, but I've completely forgotten it. I played it once. Um, the big Rachmaninoff trio, Elie Jaik, number two. Um, so I've been at the piano, just looking at it, just sort of seeing where the first subject is, where the second subject is, and the development, which subject he's talking about. It's like, you know, following the characters in a novel, what happens to them. And then when they come home and how he changes the recapitulation from the, the exposition. And all I put in my part is 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, whatever. Just which theme it is and then where the phrase changes from where it was where it was stated before, how it was stated before. And um, yeah, that's all. I mean, it, so I do a lot of my work at the piano first. I mean, I'm terrible. Very bad pianist, but <laughs> enough. I can pick out. I can pick out the pieces I need to play. I need to learn, unless they're very complicated. Um, and that gives me an idea. And then when I go to the cello, the colours suggest themselves because of that, because I can hear the harmonies in my head, and because I know the direction of the music. Mm -hmm. well, hopefully, I try to know the direction of the music and of each phrase. And you know. That is the meaning, that is the story of the music. That's how it develops harmonically and thematically, and yeah, that shows you what the emotional story is. Fantastic. Well, and thank therefore, you. the colours come out of that. I don't sort of think, oh, I'll put a special colour here. It's quite interesting, though, though of colours, that you can do very different colours on gut strings than on steel. For instance, I don't know if do you know the Britain Cello Symphony? Mm, no, not really. It's a masterpiece, but there's a bit that goes like that. It's like a children's nursery song. It's sort of strange. And I learned that piece on gut, and first of all played it on gut. And I did the whole passage, Senza Vibrato, really trying to make it sort of ear like an eerie um, sort of memory of, of a nursery tune. And then I switched to steel strings for that sort of piece, including, you know, including the Britain Cello Symphony, and I played with Rostropovich conducting. And he saw it, well, why are you playing that without vibrato? I saw it inside. He said, well, maybe for a few notes, but then it needs vibrato. And it's true, on steel strings it did. He was absolutely right. Um, that it sounded just dead, 
didn't sound like an eerie memory, it sounded dead. Um, but gut, you can sort of do much less in a strange sort of way. You can play much more purely um, than you can because the sound itself is alive, uh, which is not to criticize. I mean, I do think the Britain Cello Symphony is better on steel strings. I'm glad I've changed sure. to steel. But there is that sort of thing that you have to do more to the sound to bring it alive. Uh -huh. And therefore, you're going to use more vibrato and more portato and things. I see. How, how was working with, with Rosabowitz? Was it <laughs> an extra pressure it there? Was or? Great. No, it was certainly, but I practiced. Um, <laughs> it was great. I have to say, if I'm honest, the Britain Cello Symphony, some of it was almost half the tempo I had in mind. And you know, his head was down oh. in the score. So there wasn't much contact during the performance except when I tried to push the tempo on in which case I <laughs> which moment I got these look <laughs> those eyes those steely blue eyes oh my god it was terrifying I felt like yeah. a dog who'd sort of tried to pull ahead and his his owner had yanked him back on the lead oh, um, but what was wonderful I mean it was wonderful to spend time with him because I mean, god what a life and what charisma but also he used to come to my room before every concert I think we have four performances and give me notes on the night before, and he was always spot on. It was fantastic. Um, and I've still got it written in my part, what he said. Like what? Great. What kind of what kind of tips would he say? Well, that sort of thing, but also, because I really wanted the last movement faster, because it's so, it's got, it's a passicale, it's huge energy. And it, for me, the way he was doing it, it's got a young, it was, it's that theme actually, but it doesn't sound all like it's in the trumpet. <laughs> was very very slow uh, young, bang, bang. <laughs> so I tried to pull pull on that's one of the times I got that steely glance but then the next day he came to me and said okay play then the fast passage which is marked vivo play that as fast as you can and I did and he said you see <laughs> that's, that's um, slower than you're than you were playing in the beginning and it says vivo <laughs> that sort of thing. I was a bit embarrassing because he was completely right and I was completely wrong, <laughs> which was most unacceptable. But um, what else did he say? I don't know, he just sort of, yeah, sort of contrasting the pizzicato passage well, during the cadenza with, or the company passage, contrasting that with the arco and things like that, just to increase the drama. Everything he said was great. Cool. I, w I wish I would have really met him i think i i was too young i have a picture with him he's one of my my heroes okay. yeah but uh, as you know I, I don't know you know i studied with sakoskaya who was a study uh, student of rosopovich oh, ah, yeah yes, so she yes. was always talking about rosopovich like non-stop anyway mm -hmm. so people were obsessed with him i was always obsessed with shafran i must say but i didn't mention that to rosopovich it's funny <laughs> where they forgot to mention it <laughs> did they have any Oh, really? <laughs> I think they hated each other. <sighs> I didn't yeah. know that. Well, I mean, you know, we're talking about Soviet Union, where it was so political. And mm -hmm. if you were successful with the politics, you got to tour abroad. If you weren't, you didn't. And that's exactly what happened. The Rostovich made this huge international career. Shafran, I mean, I visited his house after he died, actually. I mean, I knew him here. And once I saw him in Moscow. But... Um, you know, he was living out in the sticks in this enormous sort of high-rise, soulless flat. It was very different. <laughs> he lost the political game, but still, I just adore his play at its best. Sometimes it's, it can be quite exaggerated, but at its best, I think it's just, mm -hmm. it's like a Russian folk singer transferred to the cello. It's so natural and so elegant and touching. Yeah. And he has such ease when he plays. Yeah. That's true. I don't want to take more of your time, Stephen. Thank you so, so much. I think we, we have plenty and enough. I thank you so much for, for doing this talking cello with me. And I'm sure everyone enjoyed this episode so much. Um, well, that's all we have for you guys. Thank you so much, dear Stephen, for your time and sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, I love talking to you, as always. It, it means a lot that you came to talking cello. Uh, that's all guys, uh, if you like this video, share it with your friends and happy practicing.